Previously on Transformers University, we took a look at the first six books of the Find Your Fate Junior series. And now we're going to wrap things up with the final three books, books seven through nine, right now on Transformers University. Hello, my friend, and welcome to episode number 67 of Transformers University. I am your host, Anthony Brucali, owner, operator, madman behind TFU.info, the website, the toy archive, this podcast, the social media, and more. And today we're going one last time to find your fate, Junior. Uh, and we're going to address the final three books in the Find Your Fate Junior series. Those are books seven through nine. And uh, before we get into that, I do want to welcome a couple of uh, new students to our Patreon. Uh, and uh, they're actually two uh, very old friends of mine uh, who have jumped aboard the Patreon. The first is Rob G. And Rob G is one of the first people, uh, actually the first person I met in person uh, from the online Transformers fandom. Uh, he sold me uh, a pair of uh, Transmetal, two, no, Transmetal 1 uh, Voyagers, Optimus, Primal, and Megatron in the parking lot of the old Uniondale Toys R Us. And uh, so I am very happy he's aboard. He's one of the first people I've ever hung out with at a Transformers convention. And uh, he uh, pops in and out of the fandom from time to time. Uh one day in the near future, we will be talking about uh, uh, his work uh, on the franchise, uh, but that will be a bit of a ways away. And also joining us on the Patreon as one of our students, a close personal friend of mine, and that is Corey Goonan, uh, the probably my oldest uh, friend. <laughs> we uh, we've been friends since the first day of sixth grade, and uh, I want to welcome him aboard. Uh, you should check out his. Uh, YouTube channel, Gaming with Crypt Corey, and uh, his gaming company, Coffee Cake Games. And on his YouTube channel, you can you can catch him uh, by himself in some of the Gaming with Crypt Corey videos, as well as uh, the deck building duo, a, a live stream he does with his wife, Michelle. Uh, definitely check it out. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And we're going to have a bit of a, a gaming episode today, too, because uh, these books, the Find Your Fate Junior uh, books, are what we call game books. And uh, I actually missed one uh, the first time around that we did this. And that was book two, Battle Drive. And for our Patreon students, I went back and did that book as a Patreon exclusive episode. So if you sign up at the $3 level and up, you can actually go back and check out exactly what happened in that story. Now, if you want to sign up to the Patreon, patreon.com slash T-F-U-I-N-F-O. That's patreon.com slash T-F-U-I-N-F-O. For as little as a dollar a month, you can uh, be part of the action. For $3, you get the exclusive podcasts and... Uh, we are close to our first goal, and our first goal is me re-editing uh, the first few episodes of this show into uh, full-on videos. And we are at, I believe, 22 uh, students over at the Patreon. All we need to do is get to 25. So three people with $1 each could make that happen. So if you want to help make that happen, go on, go on over to the uh, Patreon and join up. So we start this series of books with book number seven. Uh, this is entitled Autobot Alert. And it's by Judith Bauer Stamper, who uh, wrote book, uh, I believe it's book six, Decepticon Poison. Uh, and a couple of interesting things about this book, uh, just going off the cover and the title. Uh, on the cover, uh, in the art on the cover, uh, in the background is uh, Pipes. Uh, the Autobot Minibot, and uh, he does not appear anywhere in this book, but he is on the cover. And the other thing that's interesting is this term, Autobot Alert, is kind of used as a, uh, a battle cry and a way to uh, just kind of stop the conversation, uh, to interrupt uh, people talking and, and, and how things go. So uh, that phrase will appear uh, throughout this book. And we start 
in Autobot City. Oh, I should mention that all three of these books uh, take place uh, with the movie, the Transformers, the movie cast, but they don't take place uh, after the events of the movie, but there are some characters that show up that are clearly from after the movie. Um, I imagine the writers of these books were working um, with profiles written to not give away the film, number one, but possibly from an early draft. And uh, I'll explain that more as we go on. But uh, for example, uh, Galvatron is in all of these books, uh, but Starscream is also in these books. <laughs> and uh, um, Ultra Magnus is in these books, but Optimus Prime is not. Uh, but Hot Rod and Cup and Blur uh, are, so is Springer, particularly in this uh, book. So the story starts at Autobot City, uh, Metroplex, and Hot Rod, uh, who is being, who we are told is a teenager, uh, is jogging back from his karate lessons. What kind of karate lessons um, does a Transformer take? Um, I guess this kind of actually factors into some things we will see. Uh, we saw in Transformers the movie where he's training with the droid bot on the uh, the ship, and um, even later in um, season three, where we haven't gotten there yet, but there are times where he is training uh, with uh, a martial arts uh, sensei. So uh, this may have been something that they had planned for Hot Rod all along. Uh, my personal uh, question is if he is taking karate lessons and he's uh, made to uh, wax on and wax off and wash the cars, uh, does he have to wash and wax himself? Now, uh, while talking with uh, Cup and Ultra Magnus, uh, an Autobot alert comes across their screen. And it's a message from Cosmos saying there is an enemy approaching uh, Earth. And uh, during this, Cosmos is uh, shot down. Uh, at that moment, Bumblebee rushes in and turns on the TV to show that a Decepticon uh, symbol uh, is on every channel and uh, has taken over the airwaves. The Decepticons are jamming Earth communications. Simultaneously, they also attack a uh, Autobot uh, research base in the desert. Uh, at that base, Springer is incapacitated, Beachcomber is kidnapped, and a coded message is stolen from the Autobots. And this is where we're presented with our first set of decisions. Do we go to space and stop the Decepticons? Or do we go to the desert to protect the coded message and an ancient secret? So we'll start with our first option. And that is go to space. Bumblebee brings in the TV and Galvatron is on the TV claiming to rule Earth. Ultra Magnus decides to put together a team of Jazz Mirage, Swoop, Power Glide, and Prowl who is not dead. Ratchet, who's also not dead, is there to prep the shuttle. Bumblebee and Hot Rod, they are a little annoyed at uh, being left out. And Bumblebee mentions that he thinks he saw Astro Train. So we have uh, two options here. Do we follow Bumblebee and Hot Rod on a mission on their own, or do we follow Ultra Magnus into space? Well, if we follow Bumblebee and Hot Rod on their mission, uh, we'll find out that they sneak out of Metroplex and head south of Autobot City. They hear a noise, and Bumblebee uh, blinks his headlights twice to signal to Hot Rod it's safe to transform. Uh, that's a neat little uh, tidbit that uh, we will never see anywhere again. Uh, they find a Decepticon base in the valley, and uh, we get some weird, very toyetic art of Astrotrain, but his head is kind of... Uh, at this weird, odd position. If you go to the TF Wiki page for this book, uh, Autobot Alert, you'll you'll see it on there. Um, and we're reminded of Bumblebee's uh, special eyesight abilities that uh, only the Marvel books tend to mention. So they head into this base, and then they quickly realize they have to hide from Frenzy, the text one, and Ravage. Takeoff time is in 10 minutes. So you're left with a decision. Hot Rod wants to stow away on Astrotrain, but Bumblebee wants to hit the control room. Well, if you stow away on Astrotrain, uh, you sneak aboard a weapons trailer. 
and AstroTrain takes off. And it's it's worth noting here that AstroTrain is kind of like not just the space shuttle, but he's also the base where the space shuttle is. Uh, and I, I mentioned recently that uh, the new AstroTrain toy, the leader class toy that has the uh, base station for him to take off, um, is not without precedent. And this is the precedent here uh, that AstroTrain did have a bit of a base mode in at least one piece of original G1 fiction. Now, as uh, AstroTrain takes off, the uh, Autobots encounter four Decepticons leaving a room called Space Gear. Space Pets! And they are all wearing uh, silver spacesuits. Why? Space They're robots from outer space. Do they need spacesuits? Well, in this book, they do. So uh, Hot Rod and Bumblebee decide they will use this as a disguise. They put on some silver spacesuits and thrust and Starscream walk by and neither notice that Bumblebee is a little short for a stormtrooper. And in space, they see that Cyclonus is in the sky ready to ambush the Autobot shuttle that recently took off with Ultra Magnus. Now, Hot Rod can commandeer Astrotrain's military controls uh, to warn the shuttle or hide and attack Cyclonus from a distance hoping the shuttle sees him firing on the ship. Well, if we go the first route, you end up getting caught by Scourge. Hot Rod will end up firing a barrage of missiles at Cyclonus, uh, warning the shuttle, but Bumblebee and Hot Rod are caught and tossed into space. Now, if uh, they hide and attack Cyclonus from a distance, and uh, hoping the shuttle sees, well, they hide and Laserbeak is walking by. Yes, Laserbeak, uh, walking instead of flying. I, You know, some of these stories do have Laserbeak where they mention he has a jet mode and they kind of mention him as a robot. I don't think the authors realized that Laserbeak uh, was a bird. Uh, or there was plans for Laserbeak to not be a bird. Uh, it's one or the other. So Hot Rod and Bumblebee sneak into uh, a room that is labeled uh, the Dirty Tricks Department. Whether or not they're done dirt cheap, uh, this book does not say. Laserbeak sees something uh, and follows them, but is quickly called to the control room. Uh, Hot Rod sets up his shot and snipes at Cyclonus. Cyclonus is damaged and the shuttle is warned. Hot Rod and Bumblebee hide in a trunk full of Laserbeak's dirty tricks, uh, which include uh, plastic spiders, rubber mice, and vampire fangs, and uh, make it safely back to earth the end um i wrote wtf on my page here because uh wtf um what what a ridiculous and weird ending and i guess Laserbeak has a has a penchant for pulling uh crappy pranks um yeah make it that what you will now if we double back and go with bumblebee's idea to hit the control room you'll sneak into the control room and then the computer room you'll find the self-destruct button because of course, Astrotrain would have one of those to blow himself up. And Bumblebee then remembers, though, that there is a code to sabotage Decepticon computers. Now, do you use the code and sabotage their computers, or do you use the self-destruct button aboard Astrotrain and blow up everyone? Well, if you use the code, uh, it will crash Astrotrain's uh, internal systems. It'll also immobilize Cyclonus, which is Galvatron's ship, the Autobots will flee victorious, the end. Now, if you use the self-destruct button, you'll find out it's a trap. Bumblebee and Hot Rod will end up behind bars and as prisoners, the end. Now, doubling back to our previous possibility of following Ultra Magnus into space. Uh, the Autobots don their space gear and launch into space. Uh, out the window, they see Cyclonus, and I think this is another point to mention, that Cyclonus is depicted here as a large Decepticon uh, ship that carries other Decepticons. So he's more like uh, the ship, the his armada, if you will, from Transformers the movie, where Galvatron is flying Cyclonus, than uh, just an individual robot who transforms into a jet. The Autobots find Cosmos floating in space like this and rescue him, and... Uh, and we find out that Cyclonus is jamming Earth's signals. Ultra Magnus wants an all-out assault on Cyclonus, and Powerglide thinks 
that is suicide and has his own idea. Now, you have your choices here. Do you go with Ultra Magnus's attack or do you go with Power Glide's idea of a sneak attack? Um, if you go with Ultra Magnus's idea, you fire on Cyclonus. You find out that Galvatron and other jets are aboard Cyclonus and uh, they come out and they transform into jet mode and attack. Uh, Galvatron's laser pierces the hull of the ship, killing Mirage, and then uh, the ship is then destroyed, and parts of Autobots are left floating in space like this. The end. Now, if you went with Power Glide, sneak attack. Power Glide and Swoop will uh, sneak away off the ship and into space. Power Glide will distract Cyclonus into firing at him, and Swoop will sneak up behind him and fire a missile destroying his ability to jam transmissions and send that Decepticon signal down to Earth. Uh, Decepticon TV is over, and the Autobots win. Now, what happens if you decide to protect that ancient Autobot secret? Well, the Autobots will plan to go to the desert, and a couple will reveal uh, that the ancient secret is a power booster that increases Autobots' strength tenfold. Uh, the formula was encased in Cybertite, a rare mineral, uh, and an explosion on Cybertron blew it into space, lost forever, or so they thought. Beachcomber found traces of Cybertite in the southwest, so the Autobots, of course, drove there. Uh, at the research center, uh, we find out it is riddled with bullets, Springer is damaged, Ratchet repairs him, but the bots... Uh, didn't get all of the encoded message, but neither did the Decepticons. Somewhere got there first, long ago. Uh, the Cybertite Sphere was found by Spanish explorers in the 16th century. So, it must be in Spain, right? Well, the ship, the Seville that found it, uh, never made it back to Spain. It sunk off the coast of California. Blur saw the Decepticons heading towards the meteor crater, where the uh, Cybertite Sphere initially landed. If the Decepticons crack the Autobot code, they'll figure out the ancient Autobot secret. Now, should the Autobots go to the meteor site and stop the Decepticons, or should they go back to Cali? Cali. Cali. I don't think so. All right, so we're starting with the meteor site. Here, Blur and Hot Rod uh, race there, and there are no Decepticons. The Autobots find Beachcomber with a bomb attached to him. They free him just before the bomb explodes, but the Decepticons have figured out the code, and with two hours left to go, they're likely going to find the Autobots' ancient secret, the end. Now what happens if you go back to Cali? 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 I don't think so. Well, Ultra Magnus will assign roles uh, for the bots headed back. Blur will be sent to the meteor site to find Beachcomber. In California... Power Glide spots the ship from the air. Uh, as Blur arrives, uh, he knows the Decepticons have figured out the location of the Cybertite Sphere and are about halfway to their location. Now, should the Autobots raise the ship on their own, or should they hide and let someone else do it? Namely, the Decepticons let them raise the ship and steal it away from them. Well, if the Autobots raise this ship on their own, you find out you have approximately 28 minutes and 14 seconds. You also have three choices. You can send Sludge to raise the ship. You can send Sea Spray in to scavenge it. Or you can let Grapple, Bumblebee, and Hot Rod team up uh, to lift the ship while Hot Rod searches out the sphere. Well, if you send Sludge in... You've got a Dinobot who's very good in the water. Uh, he gets in the water, and he drops the uh, the cable meant to wrap around the ship. He pulls uh, the ship out from the water, and Hot Rod goes in to find the sphere. It takes a little while, but the Decepticons are incoming, so the Autobots, they hide. Blur takes the sphere and races it back to Metroplex, while the rest of the Autobots uh, wait in ambush uh, for the Decepticon jets, the end. Now, if you send Sea Spray in to scavenge it, he will uh, dive in, he will find the sphere, but he will also find a shark. 
do 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 do. Uh, this shark will attack. Sea spray will uh, shoot it uh, with his weapon in a stun setting, and then escape with the sphere and bring it up to the Autobots, who will then bring it back to Metroplex. Uh, the end. Now, if you let Grapple, uh, Bumblebee, and Hot Rod uh, try to make teamwork make the dream work, well, Bumblebee will uh, dive in and attach uh, a hook to the ship, but nothing will happen. Turns out Grapple's crane uh, is malfunctioning, and you will need to wait for Ratchet to repair it. Hot Rod, he's ready to search the ship, but then you hear some noise. It's Decepticon's uh, in the air. It's their jets. You've taken far too long, longer than that 28 minutes and 14 seconds. Uh, and, uh, they fly by, they blow up the ship and they blow up the sphere and hot rod is left in a literal cliffhanger hanging off a cliff. Now, what happens if you decide to let the Decepticons do it and you steal it away from them? Can't someone else do it? Well, Galvatron and company will arrive. The Autobots will uh, hide, and the Constructicons will form Devastator to lift the ship out on their own. As Sea Spray, Springer, and Topspin, watch, we got another appearance by Topspin in one of these books. Uh, they are the firm belief that he is a boat. Uh, they devise a plan to fire on Devastator while Springer uh, goes searching. Uh, some other Autobots also have a plan. Braun, Ironhide, and Grapple want to hoist up the ship while they s send in a smaller bot to search for the sphere. Well, these are your choices. What do you do? Do you go with Springer and uh, his plan, or do you go with the old heavies? Well, if you go with uh, Springer's plan, Sea Spray and Topspin will create a diversion, and Springer will enter the ship and find the sphere. Uh... He will show off his leaping ability, which, again, is something that must have been in the uh, character notes for him uh, prior to the movie, that he uh, jumped a lot. And he jumps out of the ship and gets back to uh, Metroplex with the sphere. The end. Now, if you went with the old heavies, Grapple will fire his hook and uh, secure the ship. Uh, the Decepticons will attack, and the Seville will get caught in the crossfire. Crossfire, you get caught the crossfire. The sphere will be destroyed, and the Autobots will be pinned down the end. And that is the entirety of Autobot Alert. <laughs> and that takes us to book number eight, Project Brain Drain by Barbara and Scott Siegel. Um, as I mentioned in the uh, Patreon episode, because they wrote Battle Drive, uh, they are currently writing about uh, Broadway in New York, and uh, that's really about all I've got on uh, Barbara and Scott Siegel. Now, uh, this cover has uh, Ratbat and Cyclonus on the cover chasing Rekgar and Sparkplug. Um, Ratbat and Cyclonus never appear in this book, uh, much like Pipes in the previous book. Now, for a first run through this story, I'm going to toss it to my good friend, Gabriel Owens, the Salty Seaman. Hey folks, Salty Seaman here, covering uh, the Find Your Fate Junior, uh, one of the last ones I'll be doing, Book 8, Project Brain Drain. Now this is one, uh, when I got the list of like what will be the upcoming, uh, what, is, what will be the last of these uh, Find Your Fate books, uh, the titles, this is the one that the, the cover popped immediately in my head. Uh, as I said, I think I've said before, I believe I had all of these books as a kid, along with most of the G.I. Joe ones. But, uh, you know, I had certain favorites over other ones. This one I'm assuming is one I must have read a lot of over and over again because uh, I ended up ordering on Amazon. It was like six bucks. And I look at the cover, Air From Engine cover, and it's pretty much what I remembered. It's uh, Rat Bat and Cyclo. I don't know if I remember Cyclonus being in there, but I remember the Rat Bat. Uh, a white-haired uh, spark plug with wiki uh, writing a uh, Rekgar, and there's Cyclonus in the background. They're all, of course, very, very, very toy accurate down to Ratbat's uh, chest holes with the uh, the arm and his uh, ba his back backpack guns uh, sticking through very visibly. So uh, very fun. Uh, written by Barbara Siegel and Scott Siegel. I assume they are a uh, married couple. 
I think may, I've, I know I've seen their name before on a few other uh, items. I'm sure uh, Anthony will go further into detail about the seagulls. Uh, the book itself has a uh, orange motif, at least the version I have. I know there are a couple of variants of these books. I have the one I had as a kid, which is a uh, you know, matching color scheme of the desert with, uh, of course, Rekgar, who, uh, who was nice. To, he gets a bit of a, uh, you know, a bit of a spotlight here because he, there's not a lot of real canon on him, even though he's well remembered. But essentially, he's the mo- he's, you know, in the movie, and he pops up in the cartoon here and there, and he's, you know, kind of there. He's, uh, you know, whatever plot point they need him for, and he shows up and he speaks a bunch of TV catchphrases, and that's kind of it. Uh, and we never see him on the planet where he gets all of his uh, his pop culture love, Earth. He's always, uh, almost always on uh, junk, and I think we, we've seen him a few other places in the galaxy, but I believe we've never seen him on Earth, so we do get to see him on Earth in this book, so pretty neat, and a little bit of a uh, little, little more canon on uh, Redgar, uh, who we basically won't see as a character, despite being fairly popular and well-remembered from the time, uh, essentially till uh, Transformers Animated much, much further down the line. So the back cover uh, tells us Galvatron and his Decepticons have discovered a way to drain the incredible amount of unused energy out of the human brain. Uh, this, of course, based on the idea that humans only use 10% of our brain, which we know now is a fallacy from uh, a misunderstood uh, research. A rock concert with half a million spectators is where they plan to begin. Sparkplug intercepts the news of this evil plot. He knows that only the Autobots can save the human race. The Autobots and you. And the back cover picture is just a uh, kind of uh, cut and paste inset of the uh, outside picture, of the front cover picture, so nothing really uh, exciting. So, uh, and then this book we have, uh, if you're wondering what the Spark, the Wiki family dynamic for this particular piece of of uh, side canon is it is Spike and a spark plug a Woodwicky, uh one of the more familiar ones most people are. Uh, spark plug is uh, leaning towards you know the the characterization of him being kind of a gadgeteer, uh, you know, a really smart guy. Is we we sometimes seeing it being very very intelligent, someone the Autobots even go to council to. And other times he's just kind of he's just he's just a mechanic who you know has got a knack for certain things. But regardless, he's trying to build a radio system. Uh, it's kind of kicking his butt. Spike says, "Don't worry about it. You'll you'll get that, you'll figure it out. You, nothing's ever beat you yet." Uh, but he's on his way to a rock concert up in Haywood Heights. They're expecting half a million people. Uh, Sparkplug tells him to be careful. He says, "Don't worry about it." And uh, before he can say any more. Uh, here's the conking of a horn, and uh, Spike tells him it must be the guys. So uh, as soon as uh, Spike takes off, Sparkplug gets the radio working, and wouldn't you know it, he happens to uh, found a secret frequency of the Decepticons right off the bat, and he overhears a message between Soundwave and Galvatron. Soundwave says their their project is a success, the brain drain. He goes on to say how, you know, it will drain the unused mental uh, capacity of humans because they're all dumb. And but now they'll really be stupid once we drain them. Uh, Galatron's no room for levity. Kind of tells him to get to the point. They figure out, okay, there's this concert, you know, the same one Spike's going to, where there'll be uh, half a million humans. Uh, there is a bit of a... Uh, it's a little bit of a joke here. Uh, Galatron doesn't know what a rock concert is, and he says... I don't know what kind of music these rocks play, but tonight there'll be roughly 500,000 humans gathered at a place south of you called Hay- Haywood Heights. Of what the humans called Haywood... The sentence doesn't make any sense. And ends up st- stepping a little bit on the joke at the beginning, which is kind of neat. You know, Galatron assumes rock concert is a concert played by rocks. And assuming he's met rock-type people in his travels through the galaxy. So, you know, makes sense to him. In his logic circuits, but uh, this is this is taking us from page ones, two, and three, and now we have our we are at our first uh, quandary here. If you think Sparkplug should immediately set out for the Metroplex? Turn to page seven. Think he's trying to contact the Autobots with the radio set? Turn to page ten. 
So that's those are the two choices uh, we have with uh, Miss Spark Plug. So I'll mark this choice here, and we're going to go to the first one. We're going to go to right to page seven. So the book. So deciding to be uh, rushing off with haste, despite working with the Autobots, you'd think this guy would have, would have uh, better tires as he is a couple miles from Metroplex, uh, Autobot City, a spark plug, blows out uh, his, right, his front right tire. Oh, spark plug. So now we turn to page 34. All right, the car has uh, wrecked, hit a telephone pole, and is completely trashed. No hope of uh, being uh, fixed. Uh, but luckily, spark plug is not hurt. So, but he knows he's only a couple miles from uh, Autobot City. He knows his way there pretty well. He can go, go there uh, on foot, either straight on the path, the regular path, or he knows uh, he could take some hills and take a shortcut. So, let's, uh, stay a little re let's see if we stay a little reckless here. And uh, we're going to go to page 17 and take the shortcut. And we'll mark that. And once again, our haste has led to our doom as we reach our first dead end as spark plug. Uh, in a hurry to climb all these hills, slips and falls to his doom and dies. Uh, apparently, very horrifically, he falls into a deep ravine from which there's no escape, which I assume means he is beaten and broken and all sorts of fun stuff, and slowly dies of, uh, you know, if he doesn't die of, you know, shock or blood loss, probably uh, dehydration in a couple days. So, sorry about that spark plug, you will be missed. Now, so let's step back one more page, and I'll see what happens if he takes a safe route on page 12. So taking the safe path is not too long before Sparkplug is met by Bumblebee, who, after telling him the grave situation, hops in, and Bumblebee rushes, uh, breaking every speeding law, crashing through the city gate, and stopping in front of the council, where we're going to meet the greatest Autobot of all time, according to the book. Ultra Magnus. Now we turn to page 29. So after getting scolded from uh, Ultra Magnus for breaking all the speeding laws in Metroplex, Bumblebee and Sparkplug explain the dire situation, and Ultra Magnus comes up with two plans. One to uh, attack their home base and cause the Decepticons to uh, divert from their plan and go back and defend, or set up a trap for them at the concert. Uh, we're going to go with the trap, so we're going to turn to page 55. So apparently their complicated trap is to show up ahead of time and ho hopefully ahead of time and catch them, you know, and beat them to the first shoot, I guess. Uh, I I don't know. Maybe, maybe this was a poor plan. I thought Ultra Magnus had a better plan in mind, but this is it. So now we move on to page 42. So the Autobots lay in wait, and as the 478,437 people watching the concert sit there unbeknownst to them, the Decepticons get ever closer and closer, and uh, Ultra Magnus is basically going not till the night till the lights of their eyes. Wait, wait, wait. And now we move on to page 46. So yes, it's a poor plan as uh, they open up fire on the Decepticons. They decide to set the parking lot on fire full of you know, hundreds of thousands of cars. And so the, the Autobots are forced to make a decision either to withdraw or uh, hold their ground and hopefully defeat them before they're burned to a crisp. So let's have the Autobots hold their ground and we'll turn to page uh, 48. And now a big, big battle ensues as the gasoline-soaked Autobots are getting into a hand-in-hand -hand combat with the Decepticons and like two large wrestler, enormous wrestlers Galvatron and Ultra Magnus wrestle. Uh, they look to be, uh, you know, trying to figure out how to uh, do do some kind of waltz together from the picture, which is uh, uh, kind of odd. The, the, the art in this one has not been my favorite, I gotta say. Uh, but we will turn now to see what happens in this battle on page 64. Uh, the, the battle between Galvatron and Ultra Magnus continues. Uh, tries to twist his uh, Ultra Magnus' head off. And I uh, got, it was like uh, Ultra Magnus is uh, about to do a, uh, it's like he's coming off the top rope. And uh, it was like Galatron's getting his knees up in the photo, but of course this is actually, uh, Galatron's about to attack him with all his weapons. 
And Ultramatics is apparently stunned, and Page 8 will tell us more. As the battle continues, the uh, Decepticons decide to try to activate their Project Brain Drain. Uh, Bumblebee and Hot Rod see uh, Soundwave trying to uh, lift it up, so we have Bumblebee being closer, but Hot Rod being faster. Which do we choose? So we're going to go with Hot Rod as the best chance and turn to page 18. And uh, Hot Rod zooms towards them, and uh, they can't believe it, but suddenly the heat is too much, and... Uh, Holy cow, he's going so fast. Oh, crap. And his tires burst from the heat. And if you think you can stay in the heat, turn to page 57. There is no other option. So I guess I'm turning to page 57. So Galvatron, our hot rod, goes so fast, he still blows through a ring of fire. fire but he's now out of action because of all his damage, and Galvatron starts storming towards him to get the device. But so does Ultra Magnus, who will get there first. Let your fingers do the racing and turn as fast as you can to page 72. And thus we reach our first happy ending as Galvatron does get there first, but Ultra Magnus is there. He counterattacks. We get Galvatron throwing some electric wires. He gets fried. The Autobots, once he, get, he gets free, orders the Decepticons to retreat in good Galvatron slash Megatron style. And the Autobots celebrate in front of 500,000 Screaming Rock fans. And uh, our picture ends with Decepticons fleeing in the background. And uh, I guess Cup, Ultra Magnus, and Hot Rod partying and dancing with the humans at the concert. There is a, uh, a drum. You can make a drum set in the background, but no one apparently playing. So maybe there's a drum, plaque, drum track currently playing. So, uh, yeah, that will, uh, that, will, that will take us to through two endings. One bad, one sorry. We'll do, well, let's do one more. Let's go back to the parking lot. Uh, let's see what happens if they would have retreated and turned to page 58. So as the Autobots try to figure a way out of here, the flames uh, jump up and get worse. But luckily they stop the Decepticons on the ground from getting closer, but does not stop the Decepticon jets. And we have, uh, I guess, Spike standing here in the flames and just a, t -sh just a shirt and jeans next to Ultra Magnus and uh, Bumblebee with uh, his original toy head. Looks like uh, two Seekers coming down on them. One of them, I think, is Dirge. And um, I believe probably supposed to be Cup on the right foreground, which is really, really hard to tell with the art style. So let's turn over to see what happens on page 24. So laser beak thrust and dirge swoop down, keep on firing on the Decepticons. Uh, Ultramax fires back, ordering, the, ordering them to pour on the attack. Galvatron uses this as his chance to turn on the brain drain device. Bumblebee spots him, this time all by his lonesome, and decides he is going to run through the fire and destroy the mighty Galvatron. So now we'll turn to page 36. So Galvatron, or Bumblebee, despite the blazing heat and fire everywhere, manages to get to Galvatron, but he has no weapon that can really do anything to hurt Galvatron, so he's left with two ideas. He can either uh, run, uh, run into Galvatron in his car mode, or he can attempt to throw a flaming car at Galvatron, since uh, throwing a flaming car at Galvatron sounds cooler to me. We're going to go to page 45. And we once again run into a bad ending as Bumblebee decides the truck to pick up, of course, makes the most sense as an oil truck, which they blasts out of his hand. And it says nothing is left of Bumblebee but a gruesome smear. Man, these books are gruesome with the deaths at times. So we lose uh, Galvatron as victorious, unless you, the reader, open up the book and try again. And that's where the Salty Seaman will uh, leave this book. Uh, and uh, I'm sure Ant will finish off the rest of the threads I did not get to, including Redgar, who I, I, t I talked up and never got to, sadly. But uh, that is, uh, I will will uh, gleefully listen and see uh, where Ant gets to uh, Redgar. And uh, other than that, back over to you, brother. And don't forget, you can catch Gabe on his YouTube channel, The Salty Seaman, at youtube.com slash recharge138. You know, the uh, ending Gabe 
ended up on there with Bumblebee exploding from the uh, picking up the oil truck. That ending uh, mentions that there is nothing left but a windshield wiper of Bumblebee. Uh, if you decided otherwise, though, to crash into Galvatron, uh, Bumblebee becomes a fireball and crashes into Galvatron. Uh, and Galvatron does not fall, but Bumblebee explodes, destroying the brain drain device. Doubling back to one other of uh, Gabe's choices, and that is when uh, Soundwave is about to give the brain drain device to Galvatron. Instead of sending Hot Rod to intercept, if you sent Bumblebee to intercept, Bumblebee will get spotted, and Galvatron will stomp Bumblebee to death before using the Brain Drain device. This is not a good series of endings for Bumblebee, <laughs> I must say. All right, now let's double back to a few of the other choices Gabe may have had. Okay, so all the way back to where uh, Bumblebee ends up at Autobot City hanging out with Ultra Magnus. And, uh, you know, it's mentioned that Ultra Magnus is the leader of the Autobots here. It really makes me wonder if um, in an early version of this script, especially considering the way the toy is made as a retooling of the original Optimus Prime toy, uh, if Ultra Magnus was initially planned to be an upgraded form of Optimus Prime, I mean, like, all signs point to yes here, right? And uh, this this book and, and all the things that are mentioned in it uh, really do give that uh, illusion. Now, if you had decided to attack Decepticon headquarters and force Galvatron to come back to it, you'll end up at a Decepticon base on a mountain. There is snow on three sides, and it is a slow climb to get up, and time is running out. And you're left with two choices here. You can attack now, or you can scout their defenses. If you attack now, the uh, Autobots are overrun. The Decepticons accidentally blow up the uh, broadcast equipment and cannot contact Galvatron to return. Uh, he ends up going to the concert using the Brain Drain device, and everyone loses the end. Now, if you decided to scout the defenses... Uh, the Autobots would get spotted, and the Decepticons would radio Galvatron. The Autobots would be flanked uh, pretty badly uh, when uh, Galvatron returns, holding the Brain Drain device. But Ultra Magnus will uh, shoot at the snow-covered mountain, causing an avalanche, destroying the device. The end. So uh, one positive, one negative outcome if you had gone that way. Now for the whole other set of stories in this book. Uh, these are the ones that have Rekgar uh, um, that uh, Gabe had uh, mentioned he was on the cover. So let's let's see how you get there. So it starts with uh, the first decision. Uh, instead of heading to Metroplex with Sparkplug, uh, you try and fix the radio to signal the Autobots. In doing so, you uh, end up contacting Rekgar. And you accidentally mistake him for an old radio commercial because he speaks in TV. Sparkplug will ask for Ultra Magnus and Rekgar will come and pick up Sparkplug. On the way, Sparkplug uh, spots a building he thinks is a Decepticon lab. Now you're left with choices here. Do you sneak into the lab or do you continue on to Metroplex? Well, if you sneak into the lab, you'll race for an open door. As you race for this open door, Soundwave comes out with the Brain Drain device and opens fire. Sparkplug and Rekgar flee, uh, but they get cut off. Soundwave offers you a pair of options. You can either surrender or you can run. If you surrender, you find out that uh, the Decepticons aren't terribly honest and uh, they will shoot and kill both Sparkplug and Rekgar. An ending by execution. Now, before we go on to the run, I do want to just talk a little bit about uh, the previous set of choices because it's a shorter uh, distance, and uh, if you decide to run, the story does carry on for a bit. So if you decided to skip the lab and continue to Metroplex, on your way, Rekgar would break down, and uh, he has no spare parts to uh, fix himself. You end up stranded and run out of time. The end. All right, now that we got that wrapped up, let's 
head on to uh, what happens when you run from Soundwave. Uh, if you flee uh, from Soundwave, you, you get fired at, uh, and you get knocked into a lake with Rekgar. Hot Rod, Cup, and Jazz, they show up to rescue you. Now, once they rescue you, you have a, a choice here. You can go as a group to counterattack, or you can send Hot Rod back to Autobot City for reinforcements. If you go as a group to attack, you'll make it inside that lab, and Soundwave will emerge again with the Brain Drain device. You can either have Hot Rod shoot the Brain Drain device, or have Jazz stun the Decepticons with uh, some feedback and his uh, light and sound share. If you choose the Hot Rod choice here, Soundwave will trip as you're shooting at him, the shot will miss the Brain Drain device, and the device will fly into the air where it's caught by Laserbeak, who flees with it and flies it to the concert. You lose the end. What a tough bit of luck there. Now, if you had uh, Jazz stun those Decepticons, he'll end up blowing Soundwave apart. Uh, wow, what an ending there. <laughs> That's pretty neat. Uh, and then uh, the Brain Drain device will be crushed under his body. Finally, if you send Hot Rod back to Autobot City for reinforcements, uh, the Autobots will go to the concert. Uh, Decepticon jets are on their way. They can hear them, but they're not sure what direction they're coming from. So you need to guess which direction those jets are coming from. You're left with two choices. Either they're coming from the west or they're coming from the south. If you guess that they were coming from the south, you'd be wrong. And uh, because they're coming from the west, they're using the sun as a way to uh, cover uh, their approach. And what happens here is the Autobots get blown up and Galvatron uses the brain drain device. Now, if you chose the west, you'd get the drop on the Decepticons and fire. You'd hit Dirge and Thundercracker, but the Autobots would start getting hit. Cup would lose an arm. Rekgar would get blown up multiple times, and Galvatron would arrive with the Brain Drain device. Sparkplug sees a cloud of dust on the horizon while he's repairing Rekgar, and he's left with one more choice. Do you signal whoever is causing that dust, or do you keep repairing Rekgar? Well, if you signal whoever's causing that dust, You'll find out it's Hot Rod, Ultra Magnus, and the Autobots. Ultra Magnus will shoot and destroy the Brain Drain device, the Decepticons will retreat, and everyone goes on happily ever after. If you keep repairing Rekgar, Rekgar gets repaired and transforms. He smashes into Galvatron and the Brain Drain device, destroying it. The Autobots arrive, they fight and win, and the Decepticons flee. The end. And there you have it. That's all of the choices for Project Brain Drain. We've got one book left, and it's book number nine, The Invisibility Factor by Josepha Sherman. Now, one of the things I like about Josepha Sherman's story here, and she's done one other of these Find Your Fate Junior books, is that uh, she gives you a lot of options in terms of choices. There's a lot of different ways the story can go, and there's uh, some ways that this story uh, doubles back uh, to the same spot, um, which I just think is a mark of a well-crafted uh, find your fate or choose your own adventure kind of story. And uh, So uh, good job by her. Uh, the cover is interesting because it features Cup and Hot Rod watching Galvatron exit a spaceship that is clearly the Millennium Falcon. Um there's really just no denying uh, what was painted on the cover, but it is still a pretty neat cover. And we begin where uh, Hot Rod and Cup are uh, cruising the desert, and Cup is regaling Hot Rod with some of his old war stories, and they spot this UFO. Uh, you have a choice here right off the bat. You can investigate the UFO, or you can go for backup. If you investigate the UFO as it lands, uh, you'll find that a woman walks out. Who is it? Well, it's Sarah Sanders. Um, that is not to be confused with uh, former White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Uh, the difference between the fictional one and the real-life one is that the fictional one actually believes in science. You find out that Sarah Sanders, the fictional one, is working on an invisibility device. And as you hear about this device, you are left with two choices. Uh, you can have Hot Rod uh, just take the thing, steal it, or you can have uh, the Autobots talk her into using it to help 
uh, the Autobots. If you take that first choice and just decide to steal it, uh, Hot Rod speeds off with it. He'll accidentally trigger the self-destruct mechanism on the device and blow himself up the end. Lesson learned, kids. Don't steal. Now, if you uh, talk her into using it to help the Autobots, you go on quite quite the adventure here. Uh, she does not want this device used for war. Why? Huh. Good God, what is it good for? The Decepticons then will suddenly attack and Sarah Sanders will drop the device as the Autobots flee with her. The Autobots hide among the rocks and Galvatron examines the ship and finds the device on the ground. Here, you're left with three choices. You can try to attack Galvatron and the Decepticons immediately, you could try to steal back the device, or you can go for reinforcements. If you attack right now, well, guess what? You were too hasty. Hot Rod and Cup will be destroyed immediately the end. Now, if you try to steal back the device, uh, you will follow the Decepticons into a canyon as they uh, leave with the ship and the device, and Cup has an idea. Uh, at the top of the canyon, the two Autobots race back and forth, firing from different directions, tricking the Decepticons into thinking that there's a whole army above them. The Decepticons fire back in confusion, but during all the craziness, Hot Rod will sneak down and realizes that Galvatron is closer than the device. So you're left with another two choices here. You can attack Galvatron straight on, or you can try to steal the device back from Shockwave, who's holding it. Now, if you attack Galvatron straight up, you'll get spotted by Starscream, and Hot Rod will get destroyed. The end. If you try to steal the device from Shockwave, uh, you'll be successful and race off. Uh, you'll get some cover from Cup, uh, who will cause a rock slide, locking in the Decepticons, and the Autobots escape. The end. But that's kind of a quick story, right? So let's go and see what we get if we went and got reinforcements. If you went and got reinforcements, you'd find out the Decepticons' plan on uh, stealing the ship and uh, heading into space with the uh, device to study it. Hot Rod and Cup will race back, and Ultra Magnus will launch a shuttle. Uh, but you won't be able to find the Decepticons in space, so you need to decide where you're going to look for them. Uh, you can either look for them on the dark side of the moon, you can look for them uh, in a nearby asteroid belt behind Mars, or you can figure that maybe the Decepticons have figured out the invisibility device and uh, you should go back to Earth. If you go to the dark side of the moon, uh, turns out you won't be able to see anything on the moon. Uh, and you're left with a pair of choices here. You can uh, go with Hot Rod's plan of firing a few shots down at the moon to draw out the Decepticons or... You can go with uh, Jazz's plan, uh, which uh, they will only tell you if you decide to choose it. So let's start with Hot Rod's plan. If you fire down at the ship, the uh, Decepticons will come out. They'll fire back and destroy you. Uh, the end. <laughs> but uh, if you go with Jazz's plan, uh, the Autobots decide to kill all the power on the ship and pretend to be a derelict ship. They send a probe out and... The Decepticons, thinking that the probe is a ship, fire at the probe. Then, the Autobots find the Decepticon location, fire on their ship, and blow it up. The end. Now, if you decide to go uh, to the asteroid belt, or if you just decide to quit on uh, looking for the Decepticons, you'll end up uh, in a couple of these places. But let's start with... Uh, the asteroid belt, and I'll clue you into where the uh, the other choice leads you, because it's a little further down the line. So when you head into that asteroid belt, uh, you've got a problem. Uh, you can be smashed by uh, some of these asteroids. You have a choice. You can either flee, or you can maneuver. Uh, if you decide to flee, uh, you escape, but you lose the Decepticons. A day later, uh, Metroplex is attacked, and the Autobots are defeated by the invisible Decepticons. The end. If you decide to maneuver, uh, Springer is your pilot, and he's doing some fancy piloting. 
Uh, but it turns out you're about to be hit by a pair of asteroids on both the left and the right side. You're about to be a ship sandwich. There are a bunch of uh, blast buttons located on the console. They're numbered 1 through 10. Some fire left, some fire right, some fire both. You need to pick a number. Your choices here are to pick an odd number of 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9, pick an even number of 2, 4, 6, and 8, or just pick number 10. If you pick number 10, you'll fire, you'll miss, and you'll be crushed by both asteroids. The end. If you pick 2, 4, 6, or 8, uh, the left meteor will be destroyed, but the right one will hit the ship, causing the steering controls to be damaged. You'll get free of the asteroids, and you'll go back to Earth, and you'll be back at the ending for where you chose to flee. So the invisible Decepticons will show up at Metroplex a few days later and destroy everyone. Now, if you picked an odd number, 13579, uh, that will fire both sides. It will destroy the asteroids, and you'll escape. Which takes us to the part where if you had decided to just not look for the Decepticons, you'd end up here as well. And this is, uh, once you escape, you're followed by the Decepticons. And they fire on the Autobots. And you have a pair of choices here. You can run, or you can follow Cup's plan. Now, if you run, the Decepticons fire, and you get blown up, and the end. Now, if you follow Cup's plan, Cup has a plan. And it's not really that interesting, so we won't even really get into it. But uh, uh, the Decepticons will fire again. But it, they fire long enough that the invisibility device fails. And uh, it gives away their location. The Autobots fire on the ship and blow up the Decepticons. The end. And so that's all the choices if you go that direction. Now, going all the way back to the beginning... If you decided to go for backup instead of investigating, you would get backup, but the ship is gone by the time you return with backup. You can either then return to Metroplex and have Hot Rod and Cup checked out for being, uh, you know, crazy and malfunctioning and seeing a ship when there wasn't one, or you can comb the desert. What about you guys? We ain't found shit. If you go back to Metroplex, Ratchet will examine Hot Rod and Cup and find out there is nothing wrong. Days later, uh, the Decepticons will attack in an invisible ship at Autobot City. They will destroy Autobot City and kill everyone. The end. You should have believed Cup and Hot Rod. If you decide to comb the desert. What about you guys? We ain't found shit. The Autobots will find evidence of a ship and follow the trail. Cup will see something, and it turns out what he sees is that Scavenger has uh, a woman uh, who would happen to be uh, Sarah Sanders. Your choices here are to attack Scavenger or follow and see where he goes. Now, if you decide to attack Scavenger, uh, you will rescue the woman, but Scavenger will begin to flee. Uh, your choices here are to pursue him or talk to the woman uh, now that she is safe. If you pursue him, he makes it to the Decepticons' uh, outpost. Uh, you will be horribly outnumbered, and you will be left with two choices. You can run away, or you can stand and fight. Let's say you stand and fight. Uh, the Autobots will be uh, destroyed. You'll find out the spacecraft was from, quote, the planet Quintesson, as opposed to Quintessa. And uh, the Quints will aid the Decepticons in assaulting Earth, at the end, if you run away, you'll escape, but you'll find Sarah. And this will take you actually to the previous choice of talking with the woman who happens to be Sarah Sanders. You find out that she had this invisibility device and was planning on destroying it. Now, you're left with some choices here. You could try to get her to build one for the Autobots, or you can go looking for her ship. If you decide to get her to build one for the Autobots, she won't do it. She does not want to build a weapon of war. Huh, good God, what is it good for? And we'll storm off. Just then, Dirge uh, will be sent to kill her and drop some bombs. Hot Rod races out to get her and rescues her. She agrees to build a scrambler for the invisibility device for the Autobots, and the Decepticons attack Autobot City. 
but equipped with the Scrambler, the Autobots are able to see the Decepticons and shoot them down and win. The end. Now, if you go back and look for the ship, you'll find the Decepticons in a narrow canyon. You have a choice here. You can direct attack, or you can follow Prowl, who has a plan. If you direct attack, uh, the Autobots will uh, attack, Hot Rod will steal back the invisibility device, and the Autobots will escape the end. If you follow Prowl's plan, you'll have Hot Rod draw the Decepticons out by taunting them. You'll find out the base is guarded only by Scavenger, Shockwave, and Galvatron. The other Autobots will then attack, and Shockwave and Scavenger will be easily defeated. Galvatron will flee, but Hot Rod, uh, still taunting the Decepticons, starts leading them away and winds up at the edge of a canyon. What should he do? You have three choices here. He can climb down, he can try to leap over in vehicle mode, or he can try to trick the Decepticons. If uh, you decide to climb down, uh, as you're climbing down, Starscream, in jet mode, will attack Hot Rod. Hot Rod will shoot him down, and as Starscream crashes, uh, he will be uh, swept up by uh, some other Decepticons, and you realize that you found the Decepticon headquarters. Hot Rod will radio for backup and hide. The Autobots will arrive and destroy the base. The end. If you decide to leap over, Hot Rod will transform to vehicle mode and make it over the canyon. He will then return to the other Autobots and uh, Sarah Sanders will take the ship and its device and fly off saying it's too dangerous for anyone to have. The end. If you try to trick the Decepticons, Hot Rod will play chicken with them and win. And then you'll end up just at the same spot as before. You'll return to the Autobots and Sarah will take the ship and the device and fly off. Now, if we go all the way back to following Scavenger instead of attacking Scavenger, you will end up sneaking into Decepticon headquarters. You will find that Galvatron is interrogating Sarah and the Decepticons will use a Cerebro shell to get into her brain. Your choices here then become, do you barge in on this interrogation and try to rescue her, or do you come up with a trick? If you barge in on this conversation, uh, the Autobots will just be destroyed in a firefight. If you decide to come up with a trick, Jazz will use his uh, speakers and lights capability to create like a, a distraction uh, a light show, and uh, the confused Decepticons will uh, ignore Sarah for long enough for her to flee over to the Autobots. The bots uh, try to make their exit, but they end up at a pair of doors. And here, you must flip a coin. Heads, you go to the left door. Tails, you go to the right door. If you go to the left door, uh, you'll end up in a courtyard and find Sarah's ship. The ship is guarded by Decepticon droids. Uh, these droids will scan the Autobots for Decepticon emblems and find no emblems and then fire and kill all of the Autobots. Sarah will be recaptured. The end. If you flip to Tails, you'll open the door on the right and find out it's a storage closet. But there are Decepticon emblems inside. You'll pass them around, put them on, and try the door on the left. You'll end up in the courtyard again. The droids will scan you and you'll board the ship and escape under heavy fire while returning to Metroplex. The end. And that's it. That does it for the invisibility device and for the Find Your Fate Junior series of Transformers books in Generation 1. Uh, we've covered all nine, eight of them on the free show and one on the Patreon-exclusive podcast. Uh, I really do hope you enjoyed our look into these books. Uh, they were a lot of fun to read. It's a lot of work going through them all and pulling out all the endings. But uh, it's very satisfying reading them back and, and kind of talking about uh, some of the wackiness here. And there's some great art. Just It's not necessarily good art. It's just weird and different art. Uh, so by all means, swing on by to tfwiki.net and search for the Find Your Fate Junior uh, section and just go through some of these books. Um, there's some art there. I should probably get around to uh, scanning some of these because they don't exist um, 
very easily on the internet, and I've actually gone out and bought <laughs> every book in this series to do this show. And that is thanks to uh, everyone who supports the show, because uh, I did that with money from the Patreon and from uh, people just helping out. So if you want to help support the show, lots of ways you can do it. First off, uh, as I mentioned, the Patreon. Patreon.com slash TFU Info. As little as a dollar a month, you can support the show directly. And and the money from that stuff does go to things that we uh, talk about on the show, that I talk about on the show. And at the $3 level, you can get to the exclusive podcasts and listen to uh, Battle Drive, among other things that we've recorded for the Patreon exclusives. Also, once more, we are only a few subscribers away, a few Patreon students away from hitting our first major goal of 25 students. And once we do, uh, I will go and re-edit uh, the first few episodes of this show into full-on videos to be on the YouTube channel. Now, are you subscribed to the YouTube channel? You should be. YouTube.com slash TFU info. Uh, I post this podcast there. Uh and of course, you can hear this podcast anywhere uh, you listen to pods, uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and so many more places. But on the YouTube channel, there's a whole bunch of other content that isn't this podcast uh, that I do. Uh, I do uh, love working with video, and so uh, do swing by there and check it out. Now, if you want to support the site indirectly, there's uh, an easy way to do it, tfu.info slash Amazon. That'll take you to Amazon.com, and anytime uh, you spend a little bit of money on Amazon, they kick even less money back my way. But uh, I do want to thank everyone that used our uh, links from the Twitter feed during the week of San Diego Comic-Con. I tweeted out a whole bunch of pre-orders, and a lot of you used them, and um, that will be a huge help to me and the site once those items ship. So... Uh, <laughs> uh, Amazon won't be paying me until probably October, but uh, I do want to thank you all for using those links. Uh, it's a huge help. And if you want to see those links um, on the Twitter feed, twitter.com slash uh, TFU underscore info or at TFU underscore info for those of you who use Twitter regularly. I've got all those links pinned to the top of the profile right now. So uh, you can go there and get caught up on all of your transformer buying needs now for the rest of social media facebook.com slash tfu info instagram.com slash tfu info i've already mentioned the youtube and the twitter and of course you can catch me on the web www.tfu.info the world's longest running transforming toy archive uh, i am working on archive updates still as we speak and uh there is so much more to come with the site and with the podcast and uh, with the YouTube channel. Next time on the show, we are heading back to Europe to talk about the 1986 toy line across the pond. How is it different? Uh, there's subtle ways and little things and even some exclusives. Uh, and we'll talk all about that in episode 68. For Transformers University, I am your host, Anthony Brucalli, owner, operator, Madman behind tfu.info. Till next time. See ya.